Welcome, I'm Chuck Cutler. Um, I'm with Navigant. I'm a general internist by training and have spent most of my career in various roles in either group practices or health plans. And when I first went into practice, I had the good fortune of being in a multi-specialty health plan where in addition to internal medicine and pediatrics and OBGYN, we had behavioral health and had the opportunity to integrate behavioral health into my practice. And I've had the good fortune since then of working with a variety of organizations on how they could do the same thing. Because I really believe that integrated care, coordinated care is the best way to provide care and the best outcomes. And we have a panel this morning who have done similar kinds of things. And as you heard in the talk this morning about Michigan, there's a lot we can learn from each other. And this morning's panel brings you three people from three different organizations who have slightly different backgrounds and have had slightly different opportunities. And it's an opportunity to learn from them about their experience. So what we plan to do is to spend about the first 40, 45 minutes or so um, asking the panel to respond to questions. And then we'll leave 15 minutes for questions at the end. Um, we had trouble hearing some of the questioners in the first session, and we also were videotaping this session so people could review it later. So what I'd like to ask you to do when we get to the question part is to come up to the microphone so we could both hear your questions and also capture the answers. So if you want to write down your questions so you have them in your mind and, uh, at the end, that would be great. And then uh, come up to the microphone so we could all hear. So the three people on the pro on the uh, our panelists this morning include Mandy Ryan, who's the first person on my left, who's the director of healthcare innovation for Centerstone. Um, she's got broad experience doing a variety of programs related to um, uh, integration of care and coordination of care, including the health homes. Uh, working on episodes of care and emergency room utilization. That question came up earlier this morning, so I'm sure she'll have some comments about that as well. Next to her is Ruth Van Bergen, who not only has been a case manager, but is now the senior VP of operations at the Mental Health Cooperative and also brings a wide variety of experience. And lastly, Sean McPherson, who has been at Life Care Family Services since 2001 in a variety of roles everything from a family preservation specialist uh, to now the COO. So we've got people who've been in the trenches actually providing care as well as people managing the kinds of programs that we're talking about this morning. So I think we'll have a very good discussion. So with that, and there's more information about their bios in the program, um, what I'd like to do is ask each of the panelists just to give a brief description of their organization so that we're all familiar with the background of, of where they're coming from and how long they've been on this journey to coordinate care and to integrate behavioral and physical health care. So we'll start with you, Mandy. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I, like I said, I am with Centerstone, and so we began this journey um, many, many years ago, it seems like. Uh, it was back uh, in 2012. We um, saw the way the direction was going within healthcare, and we really wanted to move in that direction. We saw the way research was going, how integration um, was the way, and so at that time, we uh, looked into forming a partnership and, and four of our clinics with Unity Medical medical clinic to have co-location. At that time, we also received a grant from uh, SAMHSA to be able to do primary and behavioral health integration, and so that was in 2012. And so that really began our journey. At that time, I don't think we really realized what we were really stepping into and what that really entailed. And so uh, since that time, I think we've come a really far away. Um, in 2015, we applied for another primary integration grant in our Clarksville area. Um, at that time, we also decided to do CARF accreditation for health home in four of our outpatient clinics um, that had the grants and then the next year we decided to expand that to all 19 outpatient clinics and received our three-year uh, health home accreditation. Good morning. Um, I'm with, as he said, Mental Health Cooperative. Uh, started out there almost 20 years ago and have seen a lot and since about 2011, we have made a concentrated effort on trying to not only limit our psychiatric inpatient usage, which we were doing a very good job of, but also we got some data from Dr. Wood at Amerigroup that showed our comorbidity and also our emergency use for our consumers. And we thought we need to do something about that. And that's when we started doing um, 
a whole person initiative. We started doing integrated care, actually hired a internist and a nurse practitioner to provide uh, primary care services right there within our psychiatric clinic, which has been fantastic. Uh, we are the assigned PCP for about 800 individuals right now that we serve in the Davidson County area. Um, and we've also done some other um, things with more rural areas and some urban areas have partnered with some pediatric offices where we embed a therapist in their facility. And so trying to take this integration in from multiple levels. Good morning, Sean McPherson again with Life Care Family Services. Uh, we're a community mental health center here in uh, the Nashville area with uh, eight other locations in Middle Tennessee and one in West Tennessee in the Memphis area. Uh, we started originally as a family preservation program back in the late 90s and then into 10 care work in the early 2000s. Uh, we began kind of our integrated journey, I guess that's what we're talking about today, about three or four years ago when those health home terms and the quarterback terms and all those that uh, we began to hear were tossed around uh, and so we definitely saw that things were headed in a direction and we didn't want to miss the boat or the train or uh, whatever vehicle was, was going to deliver us there. Uh, so we hired our first uh, primary care specialist for our Nashville office uh, about three years ago. So we've been doing the integrated care with our, our kind of our main office there on Thompson Lane in Nashville for about three years, and we have plans on expanding it into two other uh, two other locations uh, in Cookville and Lebanon later this year. Great, great. So you all have at least had a few years' experience with a similar kind of program. I wonder if you could talk about one or two of the early challenges. What were the big things that you needed to overcome? Yeah, so I think one of the early challenges um, that you have to overcome is really um, understanding this new approach. Um, understanding what does it mean to focus on the whole person, and really it has to be an organizational change. It can't just be where you have one program that's set aside that's going to focus. It has to be where every single person that's in your organization has the commitment to, um, to provide services and to ask clients, what, what's going on with your physical health? And so that's not an easy change. Um, you have individuals who've been providing behavioral health services and that's, you looked at the head up and everything down, you know, you'd say, oh yeah, go to your doctor, but that was about the extent of it. So really, you know, doing that organizational change within, but then also moving that change to um, the consumers that you're serving. They're used to you only asking those questions and not really having to dive into what their physical health is. So really making that change with staff and then um, with uh, your consumers. It's not an easy change. Uh, it's one that I think we're all still progressing to. Uh, we, we by any means don't think that we're completely there yet, but I mean it does take numerous years to really focus and change that way of thinking. Uh, Mandy's exactly right. It does take a top to bottom effort to make that change within an agency. What I would contribute to what she's already answered is that as a mental health agency, we've always been, I would say, pretty good about keeping up our relationships with the voc rehab services in the area or the housing support services in the area. Some of the things that go along with traditional mental health treatment. One of the challenges once we added in the primary care is relationships with specialists. And some of the things that we've found since serving our consumers in this capacity, we've found some cancers, and it's difficult uh, number one, to get to get the effort or put the effort into talking with the consumer about agreeing to go somewhere else. Traditionally, they just haven't, which is one reason we brought the care on site. Um, and, and even having a care manager with them, it's still difficult for them to attend those appointments. And heaven forbid they fail to make an appointment and then the relationship with that provider, that specialist provider to get that appointment rescheduled is sometimes difficult. A lot of effort goes into that. Well, my two peers had the benefit of being together in Memphis yesterday, and they <laughs> stole all the thunder. Uh, but uh, it is, uh, th this is the first time I think I've been with the PCMHs in a, in, a, in a joint meeting together, so I'm kind of thrilled to have them together. And definitely I can let you know that uh, we empathize now with the things that we've learned with the billing and coding procedures that you have compared to what we have been dealing with in the mental health field for so long. You definitely have endured quite a struggle for decades, uh, I'm sure. Uh, as far as the PM PCMHs are concerned, definitely we are uh, looking to continue to collaborate uh, with them rather than replace. Uh, I think there's a, s a special place for a lot of for integrated care for a lot of our 
intensive clients, especially the SPMI, where we can serve them within the same building. But for, for a lot of the other clients, for the vast majority of the rest of the clients, we really want to look at that partnership and that collaboration, uh, which is probably been one of the biggest hurdles that we've had thus far, not necessarily with the PCMHs, but all of the voluminous PCPs that are across the state with every one of our clients coming in the door, potentially with a, with a different uh, primary care specialist. So uh, continuing to build that bridge uh, with those folks uh, in this new initiative is, uh, in addition to the things the lady said from the organizational changes, that's one of our hurdles right now that we're still leaping over. So what, so as, as you described it, it is a challenge. What sort of concrete things have you done to build relationships with the primary care practices? Uh, well, after we integrated a primary care specialist in our Nashville office, uh, we have, uh, prim prior to this, uh, under the case management model, of course, you had the, the primary care letters that would go out with the, the medication changes and the uh, uh, service changes and diagnostic uh, issues that uh, sometimes you would dispatch. And I know they are just as busy on their end as we're busy on our end. Uh, so necessarily getting a bi-directional communication has been, has been a bit of a challenge. Uh, the PCMHs, I think, are going to come into play, especially with those codes that, uh, that I saw Dr. Uh, Marriott were sharing with us. Those are ones that we will want to share with the PCPs that we're engaging with outside of the PCMHs if they're also available to them uh, so that we can uh, engage with them in meaningful ways that make their time valuable to them. Uh, uh, we have not had a lot of access to those uh, thus far, so but uh, I think reaching out to the PCMHs that we have a couple in our general Nashville area, we've already done that and hoping to get our RN kind of peer-to-peer -peer with theirs, uh, discussing issues that are going on with clients that we share. Yeah. <clears throat> have you done other things? Uh, yes. So we um, have done kind of a variety of things. One of the things we had kind of looked at was see how many um, PCPs does our population have and we pulled some data and there was over 800 PCPs within all of our clinics across the whole state so that makes it you know very difficult to reach out to all 800 of those uh, so we try to look to see where is the concentration and start with those individuals first who's seeing the majority of our our clients and then reaching out with them and starting that collaboration um, like I said we've been doing this for a few years with our grants and so we've really been able to at the beginning the, the relationship is kind of we're not really sure what it is on either side and how can we really coordinate and collaborate together. But as they learn more about our initiative and, and the benefits of it, and then they actually see the change in the consumer. Um, they see that these clients are actually following their treatment recommendations. They're keeping their appointments. Um, they're, and that has, that has built that relationship. So showing the value of this. And I mean, our overall goal is we want our clients to be as healthy and live a healthy lifestyle. And it has to start with physical and mental health together. And so showing the value and the benefits and then just working together um, in the best way possible for the, the benefit of our clients. Right, not just the relationship, but also how uh, the relationship definitely is primary and how we can help them, how they can help us, sending the information like Sean was talking about, about the change in diagnosis or the change in medication. And now all of a sudden these gaps in care that we've been told about that the consumer needs to uh, get closed and we need your help doing that. And, just trying to figure out what works best for each PCP office. What works well for one isn't going to be the best method for the next. And we're okay with that. But also letting them know that we're there to help as well. So it's, uh, we definitely want it to be a two-sided relationship. So one of the questions that came up in the session this morning is, um, how do you engage the providers in understanding what this change means and their participation. And I think the question went, in my mind, in two ways. One is, is there a script you could use with the providers? And secondly, what are the key value points? So I think you mentioned some of the key value points already in terms of better coordination of care and better outcomes. And I think many primary care providers um, struggle, especially with patients who have SPMI in getting the support they need to execute a treatment plan so they recognize the value. But do you, have you developed a kind of process or scripts or other things you've been able to use to provide a consistent message to engage people? Uh, we definitely initially learned back with these first massive attribution lists that we acquired in, in November and December, the things not to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to that's, that's sometimes more important. Yeah. Uh, when you would, uh, uh, the clients don't always understand how our billing and coding goes on. So I think what we saw a lot was that client had gone to the hospital for uh, maybe a detox or a drug overdose, and the hospitals may be coding it on the back end as a as a 
as depression or suicide attempt, but the client never really knows that part of it. So when we're reaching out to them and saying, hey, well, we're a mental health center, and that is a trigger word for a lot of clients, they say, I've never had mental health issues, and click. Uh, so they just don't necessarily identify the connection there between some of the things that they have struggled with and the, uh, the behavioral health assistance that we can actually provide through the, uh, through the health link. So definitely there is a, uh, there's some language there that you, you need to be careful of uh, with clientele because unfortunately we mention the term stigma all the time with mental illness and that still does exist for, for a lot of folks and in, in a lot of families. So definitely avoiding those, those terminologies that we use within our treatment teams is something we've tried to do. So we've, we've really tried to emphasize the, the department and the bureau's language of the health link. This is a new program uh, within the state of Tennessee. Uh, and we're trying to educate them as to the benefits of what it can do between your existing primary care specialist. And with our program, you do get to keep your primary doctor, uh, as contrary to maybe uh, others, uh, in addition to partnering with us on things that, uh, uh, that we can help you out with. So that's been the things that we've tried to avoid as well as now to include in these initial phone and face-to-face -face dialogues that we've had with clients that maybe we have never had contact with before. And that was a that was a big struggle with us that the, the bulk of the attribution list that we've had before had either not never had contact with us or never had contact with a mental health agency. Yeah. Ruth? I would certainly agree with Sean on all of that. In fact, um, sounds like you all even got in touch with people a little bit more successfully than we were able to well, on some of those lists. That was a low percentage. Lists. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then speaking of it from a relationship standpoint with PCP providers and trying to get their buy-in and, and um, agreeing to this, and I think it does boil down to the outcomes and, and, and how much better our consumers can do if everything is being addressed. Um, that certainly is not anything that they can ignore. And what I thought interesting with Dr. Marriott uh, this morning, with one of the questions that came up, she gave the anecdotal response. And that, I think, is so true that sometimes in that relationship, it takes that one win, that one win with us working together that really solidifies that and can carry forward. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, not just like saying the outcomes, but actually showing the data has made a difference. Um, when you're talking to numerous individuals, it gets people's attention when you can show data. Um, with my Clarksville grant, one of the data I love to throw out was we had 61 individuals within six months lost 410 pounds. That gets people's attention. So you have to show that data and show those results. And then from there, you build those relationships, you build those collaborations. And then when you're talking with the consumers, you have many different ways. You have to really look to see where the patient is to begin with, to, to know how do you go about talking about this. Um, you know, if you see someone who's a three-pack smoker a day, the, you're not going to go up to them and say, this program will help you quit smoking. You know, you've got to look to see where they are and what you want to um, be able to introduce to them. Um, they're not always going to understand the terminology, What really understand what does health link mean, what does that mean. So you have to look, you know, we're going to really focus on your whole person and focus on your whole health and we're going to be asking you questions every time we talk to you so that way you know they know okay every time I talk to them I'm going to have to talk about my physical health and my emotional health there's not one or the other and so that that has made a difference but it's still you really have to look at the individual and see where they are and meet them there so some behavioral health providers um, if they're not trained as nurses um, oftentimes feel uncomfortable with physical health issues have you had to do any particular training for the behavioral health providers around physical health issues to increase their comfort level? Oh, yes, totally. I mean, most of our providers um, in the past, you know, their main issue was that we had always taught, you know, ask the person, do they have a PCP? And so you can ask that question to individuals, but to some individuals saying I have a PCP means, yes, there's a name on my card that says I have a PCP, but I've never seen them. Or for some individuals, that means, yes, I saw a PCP three years ago, but I've never seen them since. Um, the same with our behavioral health providers, um, most of them don't know, you know, they don't know everything about diabetes or hypertension or cardiovascular disease. And we tell them they don't have to know everything. They have to know enough knowledge to be able to explain it to an individual that has serious mental illness. So when they walk away, they understand it. And so that, that really helps. And then also with the opportunity of having the lead care coordinators, which are registered nurses, um, not only are they going to be able to provide education to the clients, but they're also the support for the staff. So when when they have a question, they have someone they can turn to to be able to give that education. Very similar at Mental Health Cooperative, we had a 
when we initiated the whole person initiative, we did a big transition, a big push from care, from case to care management and provided education. We also continue to provide that education since we have our internist and the nurse practitioner right there on site. They're able to do a monthly lunch and learn type thing with the care managers who now really function not only as an extension of our provider for each team but also the RN for each team. I cannot stress enough how pivotal that RN is on those teams and being able to arm that care manager who's going to be going out into the field and has training and psychology and what to look for with symptoms of depression but doesn't know what to ask for about diabetes or congestive heart failure and uh, what kind of questions, what do they need to be looking for as far as symptoms, bring back to the nurse and then the team can kind of decide what to do. Uh, as with the other two agencies and I'm sure many of the other behavioral health organizations, <clears throat> most of our staff are bachelors of social work or bachelors of psychology backgrounds. So they did not have a lot of training in the medical field uh, at all other than they knew they had to get those PCP letters signed once a year uh, and, and dispatched. Um, we have, uh, like uh, the co-op, have uh, added in an RN to our uh, treatment teams that uh, allows them to, to engage uh, with their clients to ask the questions about the chronic issues that are going on so that our RN can give them feedback. Uh, in addition, our, our RN care coordinator has also been developing cheat sheets for our uh, case managers so they can know that, okay, when you, do that, when you do have a client that's diagnosed with diabetes, these are the things that should be done uh, within this time period uh, when they do have uh, heart issues or uh, when you've got a client on depression and make sure that you're monitoring these things as far as the medication. So just making sure that we're meeting all of those quality measures that uh, we're going to be held to account for. Uh, eventually, we're trying to give as many educational tools that are easy to use for our, our staff that just don't have this vast background that maybe a nurse might have with these issues. So Ruth, you mentioned a number of different roles, uh, case managers, nurses, et cetera. Could you talk a little bit more about the kinds of staffing that you've added, peer support specialists, case managers, care managers, um, RN staff? What, what sort of roles have you found to be the most effective and useful? Well, definitely the care manager, well, all of them. I, I mean, I can't, I, there, there could be no way I could rank them, but we've always been a case management agency that provides that service in a team format, very similar to what you might see with traditional ACT teams or PACT teams, with daily team meetings and being able to go over sort of the rounds for the day. Individuals who have had a crisis encounter or who have had an uh, an encounter with law enforcement, inpatient psychiatric admissions, and the like. And now we've added in the medical stuff as well. Um, and the care managers, like I said, very much function as extensions of the team. The providers and the nurses see them typically there in the office and only get one side and one part of the story. Um, the care managers are able to complete that. Also, the the, the probably the key piece that we've added in is the integrated health, the medical care, and the efforts that I see our MD putting into making sure that case manager knows that somebody has a specialist appointment here and needs to get them there. Um, but it does, it truly takes a village, and each, each person on that team truly plays a pivotal role. Does anybody use community outreach workers or others? that um, know the community well, know where to find people, try to engage them outside the usual process? Well, I think that, um, I think all of us have used those individuals already in the past. That's what our case managers did was to go out into the communities. Um, what we did at Centerstone is uh, we have a team approach for our clients. And so, as I said, we have that lead care coordinator who is a registered nurse. Um, but then we also have a dedicated team that's the care coordinators. And they're the ones that are really reaching out to the PCPs, uh, working on those HEDIS measures. They're the ones that work inside the care coordination tool and utilize that on a daily basis. And and then we had our case managers, and we didn't want to keep the same title as case managers. We didn't want um, all the staff as well as the clients to think this is just the same case management that they've always had. So we moved towards the direction of a wellness coach. So we really wanted everyone to realize that this is a whole new approach that we're doing, and we're focusing on the whole wellness, and that that's where we want to improve. So we have those that go out into the community and be able to see them in the home, see them in the clinic, see them where they are, and meet those needs for them. 
We've also, um, similar to Centerstone, have implemented those activities. We've also started using an engagement specialist, and that is somebody who is on site, and we very much are able to provide same-day access. So somebody comes in, has an intake assessment done at that time, and they're able to work with that engagement specialist to be introduced and get that relationship and that rapport started, able to be introduced to the psychiatrist, people that will be working in the clinic with them, their team nurse, supervisor, and even show them around the, the offices where our internist and our uh, nurse practitioner are, meet them if they're available, uh, so that they are comfortable the next time they come in. Um, and that's been very helpful in, in getting return appointments. Yeah, and we, we also have implemented the same thing. We call them our treatment engagement coordinator. So they really focus on engaging those individuals right when they walk in. So someone, you know, if you walk in, you're already attributed to us, you could get enrolled that same day and start those services. So that's been really beneficial. How about those people who are on your list who never come in? So that it's has been the reach. challenge. Um, we have started to try to reach out to them. We did a mass mail out of over 3,000 letters. Uh, I don't want to tell you how many we got back that the address was wrong, um, more, more than, than you would want to know. Um, and then, unfortunately, they, we didn't have the success that we would have liked to have with that letter going out um, of having just you know a mass amount call us to say, hey, yes, we want this service. Um, so we sent out 3,000, and we've had two that came into the clinic and kept that appointment. Um, so, you know, it's not really, not really that wasn't as successful as we would have liked it to be. Um, you know, and then we, we, you know, attempt that call, but that number hasn't been valid in many, many years. So that is a, um, a um, issue that we've had. One thing that we try to do within our system was to help identify individuals. So if you happen to walk in our door, we didn't have to look at a list to know. So we have our attribution list fed into our electronic health record and you have an icon that pops up that tells us you're attributed. So anybody that sees your name on the schedule knows, oh, this person's attributed. They're not enrolled yet. We're going to have someone to be able to meet them when they walk in the door. So that's been our big success so far, I think, is identifying those individuals. And um, just as soon as your insurance pay goes into our system, that icon pops up. So even before you walk in, we have that information. And same with Mental Health Cooperative. We, we sent out a lot of letters, and I don't even know that we got two that <laughs> called us or came in. Well, I think we did get two that called us and said they were with Centerstone, and we're going <laughs> to And that's all right. We got five altogether. Yeah, we got five more. Thanks. Thanks for that letter. Um, I think right now, because we, these lists are refreshed each month, we do get a new list each month. Right now, our efforts, and it takes a lot of effort, are in managing the list that we do have in service and trying to make sure that who we are serving is still on the attribution list. We have not mastered yet how to take the newly admitted to the list of attributed, of attributed folks and get them connected. Sean, anything to add? They're doing a good job. <laughs> uh, we've, we've had similar results as well, as I mentioned before, uh, with the attribution. I'm not real, I don't know if that was the original question that we got on, but uh, we did the mass mailer. We've done phone calls. We've incentivized our case managers to go out and kind of be uh, salesmen uh, for the service. Uh, that was definitely one of the things we had to look at that not everyone does well with cold kind of calls. Uh, not everyone is comfortable with that sort of salesmanship as you really had to find the right staff to do it, to kind of do that sort of community outreach to promote the program. Uh, but the staffing model, I think, going back to the question I think we started on, uh, we have very similar staffing uh, as, as the other two organizations, uh, adding that RN kind of to the team that can really discuss the medical part. Uh, and as uh, I think as the program continues, because we're only really four months into the program right now, so as our teams look right now, they will not be probably this time next year and maybe even as Dr. Marriott was kind of describing their five-year journey, I don't think it'll look anything, our teams will look anything like they will then. So we're on a, a learning curve right now and continue to add uh, those folks in-house that can help us to understand the data and the, the voluminous amount of data that is now coming our, our way from many different sources uh, and just getting the right people in, this, in the chairs that can mine that data for us for the valuable information. Yeah, the one thing that I've seen in other parts of the country which have similar challenges with wrong phone numbers and wrong addresses is um, identifying people who know the community well, know where people hang out, uh, community centers, friendship house, et cetera, and then have outreach workers go to those places and actively try to enroll them. Um, it's very difficult, and, and uh, I've seen this in a number of markets, 
to overcome the challenges that you describe. So it's understandable. One thing that came up in some of the discussion yesterday was the use of incentives. Have any of you tried incentives to get people to come in to uh, enroll? No. No. Okay. We didn't provide our incentives. <laughs> okay. We've tried that in other initiatives. Um, sometimes it's a little successful, but for the most part, it has not been as over successful as we thought it might be. Okay. So let me ask, um, it was a great discussion and a lot of information. Um, what questions do you all have? And while I ask you that, I'll also remind you just to come up and uh, come to the microphone so we can all hear your questions. I can't believe that you're either all this shy or you don't have questions. There we go. For Mental Health Cooperative, we have the care coordinators, the care managers that have individual caseloads, and right now we're staffing at about a 1 to 55 ratio, and each team has, an R, has one RN, and there are about 10 care managers on one team. So 550 to an RN. Okay. So the question, if you if you couldn't hear it, because I don't think the mic was on at the time, was what are your what are your staffing ratios? Is everybody about the same, or are you all different? Yeah, we're very similar. Uh, we have where um, right now we have three regional nurses um, that provide those services to our regions, and then we have our care coordinators, which they have a, pop, a caseload of around 250, and then our case managers are about 75 for wellness coaches. Okay. Other questions? primary care standpoint and looking at Altarista on REN, we just recently got our panel, yeah. thank goodness. Um, we have a lot of patients in the care team panel that are listed with us, but as well with Centerstone. Uh -huh. Or I haven't seen anyone with mental health, but we have mental health cooperative integrated into our practice. Mm -hmm. um, we have never seen these patients, but we don't get feedback from Centerstone. Our biggest concern has been previously of the patient being taken over by a mental health facility and we get no feedback to um, go back to your statement about the PCP being on a card that's where we get knocked so that's our biggest concern with that have you done anything to reach out to the insurances to let them know that that patient is not seeing that primary care physician or to the primary care physician to get them in that physician's office. Yes, and so, um, and then if you'll look at Altruista, a lot of those individuals that say Centerstone have never darkened our door either. Right, So, uh, and think, we have no exactly. information usually. Yes, and we have, we're the same right. way to where we don't have the information and it, they're just attributed to us. So we have a large amount of individuals who we've never seen or we they've had an appointment with us but never showed up. Right. And so, yes, we're reaching out now and I'd love to be able to talk to you while yes. we're here to be able to see, you know, how can we coordinate that care? Can we see, you know, who who are they really going to? And we've had that issue now where we ask that question of who's your PCP and then we get the release and then we send the information. They're like, I've never seen that person. And so now we're, our next question is said of, you know, when's the last time you saw a PCP? Mm -hmm. So then we can know, okay, do you even have a relationship with them? So it's been a, a struggle on both ends. Right. Um, and as of now, you know, they're still trying to put these lists together to see, you know, who, where are the, the consumers really going? And, you know, if we see, you know, a consumer is on our list, but they're going to another provider, then we want them to continue that relationship. Um, the same way we have um, when we had our own um, co-located uh, physicians and within our clinic. If you've been with a PCP for years, we don't want to interrupt that relationship. We want to build upon it and then collaborate with them. So it's been, I think, for all of us can say we've had that experience where they're, they're on our altruistic list, but we've never seen them as well. So for those, just to follow up on the question, so for those people who you have seen, what have you found to be effective ways of communicating with primary care that's not part of Centerstone? Um, yeah, so 
like I said, we like we do with your letter as well. We send out a piece of you communication form. Um, we do that at intake, and we do that annually, or then when there's any change. Um, we also um, have made calls to the physician's office now uh, as part of HealthLink. One of the things they really want us to do is reach out within 90 days and have that conversation. So you know, now that we're in our fourth month, we've really started pushing um, doing that. Our care coordinators are calling PCPs. Um, not you know, like I said, we have over 800, so we haven't been able to make the call to every single person yet sure. um, but we're working towards that and having that conversation and then seeing like what kind of relationship can we build with them is anybody exchanging medical records oh yes we've always done that where we, we, we request records from them um, one thing we've always kind of pushed is to request that annual physical that they have every year um, to be able to see what the lab work uh, is you know our individuals are really at risk for those metabol that metabolic disorder right. to have diabetes to have high cholesterol so we want to see you know did they have an annual physical did y'all test them for labs what are those um, one of the things we were able to notice with the grant that was um, so um, saddening really is that we would ask individuals at the beginning of um, our services, you know, have you ever been told that you have diabetes? Have you, has your blood sugar ever tested high? And only 33% said yes. And when we physically tested them, it came back at 77%. And so they just, they're not getting the testing and, and it's not always the PCP's fault because they're not showing up right. at their offices right, right. to get that done. And so having that communication um, requesting records, having the providers review those, um, you know, filling our record now not only with your behavioral health diagnosis but your physical health diagnosis so we can know what those are, putting those lab results in, you know, checking them ourselves, sending those results to PCPs as well. Um, it's just a, a, a new journey that I think we're all starting to get more in, involved in and will continue to grow. I know. Uh when we, we talked about there being 21, I believe, THLs and 29 PCMHs, I don't really know the inner workings of a PCMH. I'm very familiar with the THL side, but uh, as they're kind of hearing that we do have specialty staff now that are kind of heading up that side, uh, at some point, some sort of exchange, I mean, we're just talking about, what, 49 agencies here, but as we're building these interagency relationships with each other, if there could be some sort of exchange of who their designee is so that we can do peer-to-peer, so that would be, I think, could encourage this process, so that, uh, just as a possible suggestion of what might continue to help, because that, that integration uh, and that collaboration, communication does need to improve. Other questions? Yeah. My question is, uh, excuse me, my question is specifically about the data entry into the care coordination tool and the workflow that Mental Health Co-op and Centerstone has for that. So. Within the teams that you have, uh, who is the individual or individuals responsible for actually entering those gaps back into the tool? Would it be your actual uh, wellness coaches or the RN on the team, or do you have like kind of a uh, an extra internal entity that just enters data in? So, could you talk a little bit about uh, who who's responsible for that in your formula and how that works and flows? Sure, I can start for mental health cooperative. And um, we've been getting gaps in care information for quite some time now that we were getting from the payers and able to import into our EHR as an interruption, which needed to be addressed. And the person that was responsible for going into our EHR to mark that as addressed was the supervisor. And since we've had the care coordination tool, it's been great as far as the gaps in care. In fact, we're not even entering those into our own EHR as interruptions any longer. We're solely working in the care coordination tool to show those as having been addressed. And the people that we have going in there, because we have 200 some odd care managers, are the supervisors again, and then the nurses for each team are gonna be trained on how to use that care coordination tool and go in and mark those gaps as having been addressed. Uh, at Centerstone, we have our care coordinators. They're the ones that are going into the care coordination tool um, daily. They work through it as they call the clients. They bring that up. Um, they discuss the care opportunities that are in there with them. Have those been scheduled? If not, they attempt to get those scheduled with the PCP. Um, and then our registered nurses, usually they're the ones that are working with the ADT, the admission, discharge, and transfers that are coming in through the care coordination tool, um, as well as some that we had previously been receiving from the managed care organizations. Um, the care, the RNs then call the um, consumers after they've had an ER or hospitalization. They do a root cause analysis with them, try to see what caused you to go into the hospital. Was there something that 
was preventable that we could have done on our end or they could have done on their end? You know, did medication run out? Um, was there some other issues that could have been prevented so we can help um, prevent um, a future hospitalization as well as work with them on making sure that they understand their discharge instructions, um, they have that appointment um, to be able to have their discharge appointment either with us or with their PCP so that way we can prevent any kind of readmissions. Uh, ours at Life Care is still kind of a process and work. Uh, originally, the, the thought was that our wellness coach, case manager, care manager uh, would be the one to do it, but that seemed to be the one more additional straw that just might break that camel's back. Mm -hmm. uh, so we removed that from them, and uh, we're looking at some administrative assistant positions that will be working directly with our RN uh, care coordinators, uh, that they will be providing orders, basically, for the, for the case managers to be ensuring are followed through with and those AAs can follow up and make sure the data is entered. So that's the path we're taking on the path, the path we're on. Rather. Please. So it's more of a comment, I think, and less of a question. So I think we've made reference today two or three times to, um, as the state looked at the total attributed group for um, our Patient Center Medical Homes and Tennessee Health Link, it contemplated this group of high cost individuals who had no relationship in behavioral health. Um, and I think that's really wise um, and introspective on the front end, but I think there's a real, I think what the experience is, there's a real gap between how the model has subsequently been built out and providers' ability to address that group. Um, and I think, I'm hoping too that this forum, I know we have tank you're here in healthcare finance administration. Um, I really do hope that we don't just keep tabling this thing and pushing it forward. We've been talking about it since the launch of the program. Um, it's true for Centerstone, I think it's true for others. There's a significant difference between the people, the total population um, that is currently attributed to Centerstone versus the number of people that we are have actively enrolled and are seeing on a monthly basis. Um, that gap is costing the state millions of dollars in care. No one's attending to those individuals. They're hard, to, I mean, we talk about, the, you know, they're hard to reach. And then we say things like, you know, are there um, incentives to reach those folks? Are we incentivizing those individuals? And I think truly, the, the mo if you look at the model, the model really has not truly addressed um, effective ways to reach those individuals. I think most of us today are trying to do that within the current structure, and, this, and the structure's really never anticipated the kinds of human resources and financial resources necessary to address those individuals. And I think the data is there to support it. That's where much of the medical cost savings are, and I think we're leaving it. We're, you know, we're, we're continuing to expose those people to poor outcomes as a state, um, and we're really not addressing the opportunity to more quickly um, engage those individuals and get them the care they need. So I just, it's, it's frustrating, really. We, keep put, we, we acknowledge it every time we're together, but we keep pushing the issue down the road. Sure. Anybody want to comment? We do have people. There are representatives from TenCare here, certainly. You know, what I can say um, from experience outside Tennessee is that um, we're early in the process in Tennessee, and what's happened, I've, what I've seen in other sites, is as the practices start to identify the people who are the high utilizers and where they're getting care, that a variety of strategies have been effective, not universally, but more than uh, the sort of the basic strategies in engaging people. But it, it generally requires a use of the data, to mine the data, to identify who those people are and where they're getting care, and then strategies about how to locate staff and how to locate community outreach and so on to try to engage them. Um, the other thing that I found in other places is the interaction between primary care and behavioral health has been effective in engaging more people than either practice does alone. And that as the primary care practices recognize people who are going to the ER and following up with them, but their ER visit really was for a behavioral health problem, that um, they are now have a contact to whom they can reach out to engage people with behavioral health problems. I mean, I, I, I'll just give you one example because I think it's illustrative. There was uh, a patient who was having multiple ER visits for abdominal pain. And in fact, this patient went to an ER on Saturday and then an ER on Sunday and then an ER on Sunday night, a different ER each time, and got evaluated for their abdominal pain. 
and uh, the PCP was notified because it was abdominal pain. Well, it turns out that the reason this person had abdominal pain was they had a change in their psychotropic meds, which had a gastrointestinal side effect. And the PCP never really thought about it, but because of these multiple visits, he reached out to the behavioral health side and said, well, let's go over what meds this patient's on, and could any of these meds be attributing to the problem? So sometimes it takes that kind of individual and root cause analysis to get, but it's, I don't mean at all to trivialize or make the problem simple because it's not unique to Tennessee, certainly. Any other questions? I think we're standing between you and lunch, huh, Sarah? <laughs> So um, I want to thank the panel. I hope you'll give them a round of applause. <clears throat>